All right, we're ready. So today, the subject for February and the education in this series is Rise Up, Black Deaf Businesses Surviving the Pandemic. Next slide, please. So before we get started, I wanna make sure that this event is Zoom accessible. We have closed captions. So if you can look on the bottom of your screen, there should be an option for closed captioning. We also have interpreters who are voicing this event. So you can also watch through, the, uh, you can watch through your desktop. Next slide. And again, for visibility, if you can't see both me and the PowerPoint, just play around with your view options and you'll be able to see a, a bar, a line that you're able to, you're able to uh, adjust the sizes. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, but use the Q&A option, that box. The cool feature about the, U, the Q and A box is if you've seen a question that you that has already been asked, you can click a thumbs up or upvote it, and that way that question will be routed to the top of the queue. If you have any tech support needs or any comments that you want to use, you can use the comment box. But if it's a question related to today's presentation, then you can use the Q&A box. Next slide. I wanna take a minute to thank our sponsors, CSD Learns. It's, they've been hosting this financial education event for a while now, and they've been a great, and we've also had great support from the Wells Fargo Foundation. So thanks to Wells Fargo. Next slide about me. I'll keep my introduction short and sweet. I currently work for CSD Learns as a program manager, pro or project manager, excuse me. But I also consider myself a champion for Black Wealth. I've hosted this event several times in the past and I'm very happy to share this knowledge again within the community and celebrating Black History Month. Next slide. This financial education series will be running throughout the month of February. And I've worked really hard to plan this content and make sure that I was able to include really valuable community members and spotlight deaf, deaf owned businesses. Give them an opportunity to share their stories. But today I will be presenting and will be focusing on the subject of black money, businesses and the pandemic effect. Next week, I'll be bringing my friend Richie Bryant. He will be talking about financial literacy which is a really important topic within the Black community. And the last two weeks, well, my friend will be joining us and sharing their stories. And we'll be sharing different Black businesses, including Airy B, Zeta, Deaf Flowers, Deaf Flower, excuse me, so please join us for this month of February. Bring your friends and your lunch and get ready to learn. So I've summarized some points, some points, just some things that I'm gonna touch on briefly on the subject of money. I will also want to talk about the current event relating with Black money within the Black community and the impact 
the the black has the black community has a lot of impact in general and i want to talk about how this pandemic really affected black businesses and what we are doing to survive and thrive and that way we we would be able to pivot our businesses and continue on with our businesses after the pandemic next slide well, let's get started. Next slide. Before we do get started, I do want to see your comments. So please use the comment box, not the Q&A box for this option. Just, I just want to know what you've learned about saving money as a child, what you, you've seen your parents do, what your grandparents have done, what you've been taught as a child. And I, I just am curious to know what your responses are. It seems like you might be, it's pretty quiet, so maybe you are still typing. Okay, it seems like we're not getting any comments. Well, actually, it looks like we're getting some comments coming in. We do have money. Uh, as, as, excuse me. Uh, I'm just using the chat box. One second. Growing up, I've watched my father pretty much hide money within the home. Uh, it would be under mattresses, drawers, different corners of, of our home. And for a while, I actually emulated that behavior. My grandmother did the same thing. She would hide money around her house. And that's one thing that I've learned. I remember I learned about banking maybe at around age eight. And she taught me about a checking. I was not taught about a checking account or a savings account. I actually was taught to leave that at home. Someone told me to save 20% of my income and keep that in at my home. Thank you for sharing your comments. Thank you, thank you. Now, a quick poll. You're able to choose each of these options. I'm just wondering, let me see. How many bank accounts do you all have? Do you have just one? Do you have two to three, four or more? Or are there some of you who don't have a bank account? I'll take about 30 seconds to wait for your answers. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and answer my own question. I personally have four banking account, bank accounts. And three of my accounts are actually out of state to make it a little harder for me to, to actually take out and access that money. I'm gonna go ahead and look at the results of the poll. And wow, it seems like majority of you have multiple accounts. Seems like you guys have about two to three bank accounts. Um, I guess I'm, I'm the odd duck. I'm, uh, I am the only one who has four accounts. All right. Thank you. We can close out that poll. Next slide. So just a brief rundown of significant events of what has happened within Black history that has had an impact on our financial behavior today. I will be touching on these events throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. Freedman's Savings Bank. 
This event happened after the Civil War. After the Civil War, President Lincoln announced that announced the emancipation of the slaves. And so freed slaves, what they did to look for work, the most common job available would often be working in the homes or working um, sharecropping. And they would only have a, a little bit of money, a little bit of income. And Frederick Douglass himself, he was a writer, abolitionist, and he used his platform, his newspaper platform to encourage the, the freed slaves to save their money in banks. And Freedman Savings Bank was the first bank account that would accept deposits from black individuals from freed slaves. So at the time, there's been about 37 states who had set, who had, excuse me, 37 branches that were set up, that were set up throughout 17 states. And they would use that money, their deposits to invest in bonds, railroad bonds. And majority of the customers of that bank were black people and they ended up losing their finances. As a result of that event, many freed slaves, many customers felt that they didn't wanna trust banks anymore after losing their finances. They felt, you know, that's my money. I worked hard for just a little bit of money and the bank just lost it. I, my money is gone. And so that, then the black community resorted to saving their money at home. And next slide. The first black owned bank was Capital Savings Bank. And it was founded in Washington, D.C., of course. And that city has been a popular, uh, the chocolate city <laughs> for a while now. And it was about 14 years after Freedman's Bank shut down, Capital Savings Bank was founded. And there was about maybe, there was 134 branches. So it was a peak time for branches to get, to get set up. And unfortunately, due to unwise financing, mismanagement of finances, a lot of those banks had to shut down. 2021, we have about 20 of those banks left, 20 black owned banks left. So if you're curious to figure out which ones, you can look up and find out if one, if one happens to be in your hometown. If one does, then go ahead and set up a banking account. I have a, bank, a banking account in DC by a black owned bank. I actually live in New York, but I do make sure that a portion of my income is actually set, set aside and deposited into that savings account. Okay, so now we're gonna jump towards to 1920. And you might be thinking that you've learned this era before. Of course, that's the Black Wall Street. And that was based out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The area was established back in 1920, but before 1920, it was founded by two wealthy black men who moved to the area and purchased 40 acres of land. Originally, excuse me, OG Worley was who purchased it. And this land was sold to another, uh, to other black individuals. And soon after a while, establishments such as ho uh, hospitals, theaters, grocery stores, libraries, and so forth, took place. There are about 10,000 residents that live in the area and there are over 600 businesses. And that land, the acre thrived. There were, the people there were considered well off. 
they were able to have an income, live comfortably, and have somewhat of a good lifestyle. Moving on. And then I want to share um, how that community really prioritized their Black members. And they would circulate the dollar within that community for those that worked, shopped, that the currency stayed within that community. And it would circulate between 36 to 100 times before that dollar amount would leave the community, of course. Moving on to the next slide. Here we have the Tulsa riots. And what took place here, story tells that there was a black male who entered an elevator with a white female and that woman screeched and the black man escaped. Because of that, there was a mob that seeked out the black man that was in the elevator. And so because of that event, they decided to go ahead and loot and destroy the town, the destroyed homes, businesses, and the city itself. The riot lasted two days. Now keep in mind, the survivors of Greenwood protected their homes. They've already gone through um, war, so they've had guns. But the survivors compared to the white mobs, such as KKK, were outnumbered. They destroyed their community and it was accounted about 300 deaths. There were 300 casualties, as well as leaving a group of um, homeless. So now we have approached the 100 year anniversary of the Tulsa riot. Even though it feels long ago, it was actually a very recent event that took place. So now fast forward to 1955. And as you can see here, we have two pictures. Most of you are familiar with Rosa Parks and are familiar with why she is a notable individual. I'd like to share some facts about Rosa Parks about what most people don't know. So you see the woman in the first picture, her name was Claudette Bolton, it's Colvin, excuse the interpreter. And she, um, the police officer asked for her to get it from her seat. But unfortunately, um, at the time she was only 15 and pregnant and yet there were many civil rights leaders to kind of put it on the hush. But then the same situation took place with Rosa Parks who refused to give up her seat on the bus. So Rosa Parks became the face of civil rights movement. Another fact, again, even though it feels very long ago, it was not. Claudette is still alive today. And it is really important that people remember her story, that remember she was the first um, to experience this, even though it's not uh, recorded in any books. So now Rosa Parks, refused, refused to give up her seat, which then led to the boycott, the Montgomery bus boycott, because so many from the black community were upset and felt that they had the right to sit on the bus as a, on a first come first serve basis. And that there was no need to give up a seat to anyone who felt inferior. So what they did was that they would fight and refuse to get on the bus and to use the bus transportation system. The boycott took place for 381 days. You did not find anybody from the black community ride the bus. They would either um, go on foot, they would carpool and this happened for 381 days. And then eventually, 
it was negotiated because they realized that the Montgomery bus system was losing money and would end up becoming bankrupt if they did not figure out a resolution to earning more money. So they've changed the regulations and that was updated for anybody to sit on the bus. And that is the power of black money. Having the mentality saying that you won't treat us fair, then you won't get our money. That you, you um, should treat us as equals. Otherwise, um, we'd like to see change. So, okay, moving on to the next slide. All right, now fast forward to 1966, the Black Panthers. So I wanna make sure, uh, you, um, depending on where you read your information um, and depending where you, what you've heard about Black Panthers, they have a negative reputation. The US government wanted the people to assume that the Black Panthers was a hate group and that they would advocate and preach violence. Though that wasn't the case, play, um, excuse me, even though that wasn't the case and though Black Panthers did stand up for the rights, it was for the reason of protecting the Black community and Black women and to mitigate police brutality. However, the Black Panthers really uplifted their community and how they did that, we can see in the next slide. The Black Panthers provided several programs, as you see listed here. This is just a few of many. They would teach self-defense. They would have a blood drive for sickle cell drive, which is one of the most common illnesses within the community. They would provide tutoring, they would provide free breakfast, police patrol. And just recently with WIC, WIC is uh, women's infant and children. They would train, uh, do a youth training. And all of these programs were started from the Black um, community by the Black Panthers. They were not treated well, so they were tired of the government or winning on the government to provide free accessibilities, resource. And so the Black Panthers took that and realized, you know what, we're gonna have to do it ourselves. We cannot rely on the government. We can't rely on white people. We're just gonna have to take this responsibility and strive for it. With the government, um, they, the government eventually dismantled the Black Panthers organization. They murdered many of their leaders. Many of them were arrested and many were brought in as spies to investigate the Black Panther's mission. So the government declared the dismantle of the Black Panther's organization. This also means that the government stole many of those programs that were established and created that, those programs for themselves. I'm sure that you've heard of WIC. You probably, um, if you are a mother or father, you may rely on these resources. WIC is for women, infant, and children. So though you uh, might feel grateful for the government to provide such a program, you have to remember that it originated from Black Panthers. That idea was appropriated and that was one of many incidents that happened. And this is the impact of um, empowering Black money. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you a moment to read this. Okay, so I have the facts here. Now African-Americans are now 58% more likely to expect the brands they buy to take a social stance which means maybe I would do some research on a company, see what their value is, their mission. If politics are involved or if they're sponsored by politics at that time, I would make the decision that I don't wanna support that company. 
Now, if the, uh, the company itself has a value or a mission that aligns with my beliefs and my lifestyle, then it's likely that I'm more likely to buy from that brand. And sorry, again, let me, let me repeat myself. So if I see a company whose mission supports my beliefs and my lifestyle, purchasing from that company will uh, 37, uh, will more, more likely take place at 37%. All right, moving on. So go ahead and read that number. $1.2 trillion. That number is from just the Black community alone. Mind you, we don't make the most money. We don't offer high salary when it comes to employment. We're not getting offered high salary when it comes to employment. And yet we're still trying to figure out how to earn money. And it still has a big, despite that, it still has a impact on um, our economic stance. So by 20, this, this number is from 2019, but by 2024, it's projected to grow $1.8 trillion, again, from the Black community. So the number we're looking at is $1.2 trillion. And it's expected to increase by $1.8 trillion more. So this could be advertised through media, TV, word of mouth. And of course, with the Black community, we have, um, within the Black community, we're spending $9 million alone on health and beauty, on hair products. For education, it's $7.3 billion. And with healthcare, it's $23 billion. So this is all contributed from the Black community annually. It's very impressive. All right, moving on. Now, with that $1.2 trillion, the Asian community will spend that amount and it'll stay within their community for 28 days. Whereas in comparison, the Jewish community will circulate their currency and that would stay for 20 days. The white community and their currency being circulated, you'll find that it's at 17 days. And then for the black community, it circulates only for six hours and you just see those dollars with wings and fly away. And it's because black individuals don't keep their money within our community. Um, it's spent quickly, it leaves our community. All right, next slide. Now, I wanna pause. I'm just a little curious to know uh, some questions from the audience. How much of your money is spent supporting black businesses? Less than 25%, 25, uh, meaning that you don't support Black businesses much, 25 to 75%, meaning you often find yourself purchasing and supporting Black-owned businesses, more than 75% or you're not sure or it's not intentional. I'll wait about 30 seconds for your responses. Okay, I am curious to see the results of, the, of this poll. Hmm. Looks like we have a little bit of a variety. Looks like about 60% of the audience 
less than 25% of their income supports black businesses, uh, 10% is 25 to 75%. Wow, and 10% is more than 75. Thank you. Next slide. Now we're gonna jump to current events and the current impacts on our, on our black owned businesses. States with the highest concentrations of black owned businesses include New York, Texas, Georgia, California, and Florida. These states have high concentrations of black owned businesses. And the top five small business industries where most businesses are getting started up is business services, which include 20%, such as counseling, consulting, and 90%, oh, excuse me, 9% of businesses for the last four include health beauty, fitness services, food and restaurant, retail, construction and con contracting. The last one uh, that I mentioned, construction, contracting is also 9%. Next slide. There was a recent newspaper article that stated that COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis has wiped out nearly half of black small businesses. From February, last year, February, from the start of the pandemic all the way until April, data collected and research found that 41% of black owned businesses in that short three month span decreased by 41%. They had to shut down or close their businesses. Their businesses failed because of the pandemic in comparison to 22% of other races, whether uh, of white owned businesses. 22% in comparison to the 41% in the back community, black community, unfortunately their businesses failed due to the pandemic. I'll let you read this chart. This chart briefly overviews and shows the top five states. Remember the previous slides where I had mentioned the top five states with the highest concentrations of black owned businesses. So again, this data focuses during that period of time. For today, I'm going to focus on New York State, but if you want to see the full data, I will be showing you later where you can find link to, to see those slides and also the recording so that you can see for yourself on a later time. But for today and pur purposes of time, I'm going to be focusing on New York. There's about 6,000 black owned businesses, oh, excuse me, 96 in February. And the first shutdown and businesses were, when businesses were able to reopen again from 96,000, that number declined to 43,000 businesses where businesses, 43,000 businesses were able to reopen after this shutdown. By summer, by June, that number declined again. And it was a 32% drop where now that number declined to 29,000. And it declined by about 56% from February to May where businesses 
had to shut down and were not able to reopen. We had another decline, which was 32%. And the reason why businesses were not able to survive was because either their, their finances were, were low or exhausted. And also majority of the individuals who were impacted by COVID actually passed away. The highest concentration of the individuals who passed away were black and brown individuals, which means that they were no, no longer able to continue their businesses or they were not able to find further support after this shutdown. But there's a multitude of reasons as to why their businesses failed and why the numbers had declined. 41% of businesses were forced to be shut down during the pandemic. Next slide. Now, as you know, the federal government has tried to support and provide resources and money to continue on and help small businesses survive throughout this pandemic. Many programs offered is the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. That program provides money to help cover the costs of your employees, of their salaries, over, of their overhead costs, rent, utilities, printer, whatever resources that was needed to run your business. And the application process, from my understanding, was that there was a, a chunk of money available, but many of those small businesses were denied those loans and the money actually ran out very quickly. And many of, of that was due to mismanagement uh, of those finances from the government. They utilized those resources and, and actually gave that money to bigger companies and millions of dollars, took millions of dollars from the PPP program. Those big businesses didn't need it and small businesses suffered and were hurting for money. That PPP, that PPP program, the money actually ran out very quickly and businesses, small businesses that could really benefit from that program were not able to get the finances or funding to continue on with their business and had to shut down. So the PPP actually had a very big impact and, and in, influenced the shutdown of many small black owned businesses. Like I mentioned, there's a, the top five types of businesses, services, beauty, retail, contracting const and construction. Many black individuals don't have a good relationship with banks. And again, remember what I had mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, the distrust of banks, many applications were denied to black individuals and rejected their applications. So black individuals weren't able to get the finances to go ahead and start their businesses. Use, they, could, they ended up having to use their own money, money from friends and family, or, or raise money, use their own funds. And to about 20% of individuals were actually able to get a loan from the bank and be accepted. The rest of the individuals had to use their own resources to start their own businesses. That is another reason why we were impacted by the pandemic. If you didn't have a good relationship with banks or finances, and if you wanted to apply for aid during the pandemic, if you didn't have a relationship or a bank account or access to funds, uh, PPP would definitely, unfortunately, reject that application. So those, those were many challenges that businesses had to figure out and how to pivot their, had to pivot their behavior to go ahead and continue surviving their business. I 
I want to talk about how you can support Black businesses. Number one, be more intentional with, with your spending. Look for Black businesses. Seek them out. You can also sponsor Black businesses. And what I mean by sponsor, if you are a business corporation or have access to a bigger company, if you are a part of a nonprofit organization, then you could maybe sponsor, the, sponsor Black-owned businesses. Consider saying yes to those opportunities and use that financial planning and X, Y, and Z will be able to make sure that about 45% 45 of our finances is focused on sponsoring and supporting black businesses. If you can't afford something like that or don't have the resources, what you can do is maybe post positive reviews of those businesses. You know, through social media, through Yelp, liking Google, sharing their sharing their business on on social media that costs you nothing all you have to do is use your phone it's just it just takes a little extra of your time to support these black businesses we have a lot of social media campaigns for example google has a black owned friday where it, there's a hashtag and it spotlights different black owned businesses. If you're looking for different hashtags and social media campaigns intentionally, you can do that, especially during Black Business Month or, or excuse me, Black History Month. And don't only think, think of these businesses in February, think of these businesses throughout the year, every day, 365 days of the year. So, Excuse me. And I, I want to give a little honorary mention to Nakia Smith. When you give your money, who you give your money to is who you give your power to. And that is a quote by Frederick Douglass. I will go ahead and open the rest of this event to the Q&As. If you have any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and check that Q&A box. Okay, so here's a question. The first question, it says, could you explain more about what it means when dollars circulate within the community? Okay. So I'm gonna try and paint a picture. So let's say I have $100 here, all right? And I'm an Asian individual with $100 and I decide to purchase some ramen or purchase um, some food or clothing within the community, the Asian community. So that dollar circulates. That will, um, so I will drive to an Asian restaurant and buy lunch, dinner um, at that restaurant, or maybe I would go to a tailor. So whatever that, wherever that hundred dollars goes stays within the community. But let's say the fourth business, it's a plumbing business and that hundred dollars is contributed to that plumbing difference that eventually escapes and leaves um, to a different race that owns that establishment. Does that make sense? So again, um, I had shared that Asians, the Asian community circulates their dollar uh, for 28 days. Whereas if a black person was to get $100 and they were to go to a restaurant, and orders some jerk chicken. And the owner of the jerk chicken restaurant eventually will need to be spent somewhere else because they need to purchase more chicken, which then leaves the community. So if those, the, the, 
There's no black owned manufacturer of chickens. So that would leave the community. So it depends what you do with that hundred dollars. If I spent it at that restaurant and then it quote unquote escapes, leaves within that circle, then the currency um, goes elsewhere. So you would have to try and buy it. So basically what it means is you want the currency to stay within this um, community. Sometimes it will leave and then there are times when it may return, but it's not often that that currency returns within that community. So I want to mention about the slide that emphasized that $1.2 trillion, that amount is how the Black community impacts the economy only by 2%. It stays within the Black community and would circulate and go to other uh, businesses that are not owned by Black people. A job that is provided um, to the Black community to The number one job that is provided to the Black community is the U.S. government. The second is Black-owned businesses. So when you're investing back into the Black community, then that means that there's going to be more job opportunity, that you'll see more of the, that currency circulate, and that's what we're hoping for. We want to see it rise up. So that's a bit of food for thought. All right, any other questions? So this asks, are there any uh, websites other than Black deaf centers that centralize Black deaf businesses to shop from? So there are some resources on the webpage, um, but we will be spot, um, spotlighting Black businesses. If you know of any other black owned businesses, please, please, I do encourage you all to post their information on BDC, the Black Deaf Center. For, so for you as a black deaf individual, if you're considering on starting your own establishment, consider that $1.2 trillion currency circulation and how that can support your business to thrive. Okay, so I'm trying to see if I can find another list of black owned businesses. Now compared to deaf black owned businesses, um, I'm able to just throw out a couple of resources. Hopefully we'll have more available, um, but this is just generally of just black owned businesses. And there's a website by the name of We Buy Black. Dot com and Black Wall Street. And if you look on social media, there are all sorts of hashtags that will lead you to a Black business directory. So if you want to learn more, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. And you can always look at my Instagram page. I am always featuring and spotlighting and of course supporting many black owned businesses. And I can always share more um, with you from there. Okay, so the next slide please. So as you continue your journey and your curiosity to learn more about these black businesses, sharing with you, there is a TED Talk here. And of course, TED Talk is where an individual stands in the middle of the stage and there's a red carpet and they might share a life experience or advice. Well, this particular TED Talk is led by a woman by the name of Margarita Anderson. And her family's mission, their goal for one year was to only support and buy from Black businesses. During that TED Talk, she explains the struggles and her journey and found that it was very challenging to follow that goal. Sometimes she would have to strive far or to go out of her way in order to find 
anything that was produced by black businesses, such as clothing, fashion, construction, food. And she did find out that within that one year, throughout the year, um, the businesses shut down. So again, from the message previously, your, when it comes to your intention and incentive, try and focus on Black-owned businesses and such as uh, resources. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Now remember, Black Wall Street. It's been rebuilt, um, and even though still to, to this day, they are still rebuilding the Black Wall Street. It's not like what it was back in 1921. However, Greenwood is trying to really encourage and drive their community. And announced, they announced last year that Greenwood would um, eventually establish a mobile bank that focuses and serves black and brown people. So if you wanna learn more about this establishment, please be sure to sign up to this waiting list. I myself signed up for it. And um, there are a ton of people and waiting to be able to open their own account. So I'm just on that waiting list. So again, SBA, uh, the, the Small Business Administration, and if you are currently a, um, a business owner, and even though it's uh, even though using the PPP loan, you can still qualify for forgiveness. So it's just a simple application that you fill out. It's one page, um, and it's a specific amount. But as long as that you are not over that specific threshold then you have a high chance to go ahead and forgive your loan. If you haven't, and you're finding that it, you're struggling to keep open your business, please do consider the um, Paycheck Protection Program if you were denied in the past. So that's something to consider, consider to apply again. So CSD Unites recently shared um, for those businesses that have gone, uh, that are micro grant, CSD unites those employees and provides those micro grants and is considered as an application for a loan. Even though it's not a loan, it is a grant. Move on, moving on to the next slide. So here listed, I have some references and resources. Um, where I got the numbers that I shared with you all today, the statistics. So again, this presentation will be recorded and will be available as, as well as the slides. Now for next Thursday, uh, we will be meeting at the same time from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I will be having Richie Bryant, my friend, come on and explain a little bit um, excuse me, explain about financial literacy and how to pivot your way through this pandemic and how to make choices when it comes to finances. So that'll be next week, Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. More details to come. Thank you so much for joining. And again, for the first four financial education series, for black owned businesses. Next week, we will have Richie Bryant. The following week, uh, the third and fourth week, um, I will be inviting deaf black owned business owners who will be able to share their perspective and you may be inspired um, by their story and hopefully that you can establish your own business. And of course, thank you for the Wells Fargo Foundation for sponsoring this event. I will see you guys all next Thursday. Bye-bye.